Uh, could you say a little bit about uh, the Bible research of your center and your personal studies? What are the focuses? Well, as you say, we have a, a long-standing tradition of historical critical work on the yeah. Bible. And I was raised and trained in that tradition and I've continued that tradition together with a number of other colleagues here at the faculty. Yeah. Um, it means that uh, we try to read and to interpret the Bible with uh, a number of basic questions uh, which have to do with the origin of the text, with the original readership or audience of the text, and with the authors of the text, trying to find out how these authors have composed their works, be it the letters of Paul or the Gospels, or any other early Christian writing, trying to find out in how far their composition was influenced by issues, discussions, traditions that were around at the time of composition and trying to find out in how far we, with good methodological sound, methodological criteria, can go back to these original issues, traditions, sources and disputes. Because it's from there that one can have a kind of uh, sound, basic, uh, reliable uh, foundation on which to work with regard to ancient texts. That is more or less the, let's say the, the framework in which we work, mm -hmm. the background against which we work. When you ask me for what my specific purposes or topics are, mm -hmm. I have done quite some work on the Synoptic Gospels, trying to work on the uh, source critical issues so the famous synoptic problem, in which I divide, uh, de defend the uh, classical hypothesis, it's the two-source hypothesis, which is still a majority opinion, though in the last 30, 40 years it has been under fire from a number of uh, perspectives. Um, but we try to defend this old hypothesis, Markham priority and a an hypothetical source, which is called Q, that is the source of Luke and Matthew yeah. for material that is not found in Mark but is common to Matthew and Luke. Right. That's in two words the basic hypothesis. A uh, second focus of my research is Luke and Acts uh, in where again I have a quite classical hypothesis to defend arguing that Luke and Acts was written by the same author. Um, the discussion here centers more about uh, how the two works relate to each other. Uh, are they uh, two volumes of one big work yeah. or are they two separate works by the same author? So are they meant from the beginning to be two volumes or is Acts a kind of afterthought which Luke wrote after he had finished with his gospel uh, for a long time already. Mm -hmm. There again I defend the more classical hypothesis that Acts uh, was at least uh, that Luke had acts in mind, at least in mind. He had maybe not the details, but he knew when he was writing the gospel that he was writing a second volume yeah. in which he would do something completely no, uh, innovative compared to other gospels, writing a kind of uh, yeah. beyond the resurrection yeah. history. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, a third issue that has to do with historical critical research and that has my interest mm -hmm. uh, is the uh, reception of the New Testament mm -hmm. in the early church. And here uh, uh, this is not just a matter of the uh, exegesis only, so in a typical way in homilies or in commentaries, but also the way the uh, early Christians have worked. Uh, with the Bible, in liturgy, in uh, writing polemical uh, writings, in doing systematic theology, in uh, uh, writing historiography even, uh, like Eusebius of Caesarea, he's very much influenced by the New Testament in writing his so-called church history. Um, the <coughs> uh, historical critical approach is, has become a classical one in the world of academia, 
but it is often viewed a little bit uh, uh, critically uh, in the sort of, let's say, in the, among the world of believers, spe especially the Orthodox world, as you know. What would you reply to that? To answer such a concern or such a criticism, often it's more a concern than a criticism, I would say again, uh, you have to point out the force and the benefits of doing uh, uh, historical critical research. And one of the major benefits of doing this kind of research is that it is a protection against fundamentalistic uh, approaches of the Bible. Uh, with this intermediate level, where you try to go back to the author, the original author, to the original uh, uh, readership, to the original context in which the texts were composed, you create, in a sense, a kind of wall that prevents you from having a kind of relation, me and the Bible, and the Bible and me, and there's nothing between this. Yeah. Because that ends up, before you know it, ends up in a kind of fundamentalistic approach to the biblical text. And that should be avoided, I think. That's one of the main assets of doing uh, historical critical research. Now, as I said, a major focus of my research is the reception of the Bible in the early church. So I've always had an interest uh, for the way the earliest generations, and I usually work to a period up to the end of the 4th century, uh, sometimes 5th century, so, but the way the earliest generations of Christians have worked with the Bible, it, the Bible has informed, has inspired these earliest Christians uh, 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 and given models, in a sense, of how to write a church history. For instance. So again, I think what they have done there remains of interest and of importance for us today. But from there to say, well, it was all said there and nothing new can be added, <laughs> that's one step too far for me. I <laughs> think right. that later generations may have uh, had their say on the Bible and may have had certain important things to say there as well. Right. And uh, in that sense, uh, uh, one element that I have not mentioned yet, but that is quite important, is it's the contextualization of the Bible. Mm -hmm. And there, the fathers can learn us something, but I'm sure medieval authors can learn us something as well. What did they do with the Bible in a certain context to address certain problems, to solve certain problems uh, that are no longer our problem, but at least the way they have done it can give us a model of how to uh, solve or address similar problems or uh, problems that are more or less related to these old problems. Mm -hmm. And I think there they have also a, uh, a value and an importance that is uh, yeah, up to this day, up to today, I would say. Professor, I would like just to ask you a question about the attribution mm -hmm. uh, of, the, uh, of the Bible books, because it provokes quite a reaction, of course, in different churches. Well, I think you have to be very realistic and very pragmatic at the same time. Uh, what do we have? We have evidence that is very old uh, uh, of names linked to certain texts, hmm? for the Gospels, for instance. The titles are quite old. They have been, they are attested, uh, not from the very, very beginning, because nothing is attested from the very, very beginning. We have no manuscripts of the first century of the, no. of the Gospels. So, but the attestation of uh, authorship is very old. In itself, this does not say a lot, because old attestations can be wrong, mm. and more recent ones can rely on a better tradition and be right. That yeah. does not say, in itself, does not say enough. But the other thing is, what do you get there? This information is, after all, it looks as if you get a lot of information, but actually you don't get a lot. You get a name, and it's not even sure for some of these names who these people really were. Is Matthew the Matthew that is mentioned in the Gospels? It's not even sure, it's not said, it's Matthew the Imagine. disciple. Eh? Right. It's not even said like that in the titles. So there is a margin of, let's say, grey zone where you are not sure what you get. The important thing of mm, identifying the Gospels mm, with an author is not so much in the fact that you could say, well, it's Mark and Mark is not Matthew. It, it's the fact that you, the mm, Gospel of Mark has a distinct theology, has a distinct profile, different from the first gospel, Matthew, or the third gospel, 
or John. They have distinct profiles. So there is an author behind which, who has a certain view on what he wants to do, mm -hmm. who works with traditions that can overlap with those of the other evangelists. And that is more important to me than to say it was Luke uh, and I know everything about Luke. Well, we don't know much about Luke after all. We have his name popping up a couple of times in Paul, but Luke never clearly explains to us how his relation is with Paul uh, in matters of writing a gospel, for instance. No. Uh, he never tells us that Paul was his master in telling him how to write a gospel. <laughs> we don't have anything of this information. It may well be that he was better informed there and had better access to better traditions than Paul had ever had. So a name does not tell us everything, yeah. I would say. You have to look at the writings on their own. As for Pauline authorship, again, that's a very debated issue. And I think there you have matters of theology in combination with aspects of philology there are clearly stylistic differences between certain letters and others to the point that you have to explain them. Now you can say that maybe an author has changed his style over the years and that he wrote differently 20 years earlier from what he's writing now. That is possible. Again, how to find out by an author that is only accessible to us through what we have there in the writings. And, and, and this is an important aspect to say, well, certain letters are maybe not so clearly Pauline or we cannot be so sure about them as we can be for other letters. Right. Uh, and we have to take that into account. Again, that does not, there's a difference between saying this is not Pauline in origin and saying this is non-Pauline. That's a difference. Ah, yeah. Because another author can work in a Pauline spirit a disciple of Paul, someone writing in the spirit of Paul, uh, well, then it does not, so, not matter so much whether it's not really Paul who dictated this letter or wrote this letter. As, uh, more important is to say, well, it has the same spirit that you find there. It's the same kind of concern. But the formulation is differently, so there is a danger there that maybe, or uh, a possibility that maybe this is not Pauline in the most authentic way. Ten years the Bible st uh, studies were building up in Russia and even the sort of last year there were few uh, new translations made even. Mm -hmm. uh, what could you as a sort of big expert in the study of the Bible context suggest to such a, uh, basic attempts to build up the study of the Bibles in order to arrive somewhere with the fruits for the face? Well, I think it's, it's, it's a huge challenge uh, in the uh, uh, former Eastern European countries where they have to start, if not from scratch, at least with uh, uh, very little resources. They have no libraries or far too few. They have not enough people who are trained and it will take some more time even to have enough people who are well trained to take on uh, such Bible courses or any course in introduction in uh, Christian tradition uh, on a certain level. I think it's, it's, it's a work of a long, long, long uh, term there. Um, on the other hand, I would like to throw out a kind of contrastive parallel, if you want so, between the situation in former Eastern Europe today and the situation that we are facing in Western Europe. Uh, you have had no access to, uh, or large parts of the uh, population have had no access to Christian tradition, Christian faith and Christian practices for a long time. At the period that we did have access, but we are losing this access quite uh, substantially in the last few decades. And that is creating a problem, I'm afraid, in Western Europe. When you say there's ignorance in uh, uh, matters of faith and Christian tradition in former Eastern European countries, I would say there is a lot of ignorance in Western Europe today about matters of faith, Christian tradition and Christianity in general. And this danger is real for both sides there. And it can lead to the same uh, consequences that people say things on Christianity 
with really no insight in what it means to be Christian or what it means to be part of a Christian tradition or anything like that. So there we have kind of uh, alliance, I would say, uh, on both sides of the yeah. European continent.